Hello, everybody. Welcome to the gospel with me, your host, Glory Dongala. I'm excited. You know, we've been going through the book of Jude. I've been discussing really my journey to freedom um, through the book of Jude and through the meditation of scripture, how God brought about freedom in my life. And so far, we've done at least three weeks worth of material. And so this was supposed to be a five week series and it's going to turn into more like a six week series because the introduction, I really spent a lot of time and I wanted to really discuss why um, I started meditating in scripture, what led me up to it um, and the different struggles that I had in my own life. So today we're going to continue. Um, we're on verse five of the book of Jude. And I'm just looking forward to really diving in. But before we dive in, I want to pray with you. Will you pray with me wherever you are? If you're driving, please don't close your eyes. Keep, keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> but let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. God, we love you so very much. You are so, so good to us. Without you, we are lost we are bound we desperately need you lord i'm hungry for your presence more than ever we need you god i'm talking to so many people who are struggling who are bound who are stuck and sometimes it can see it can be very very difficult because we can start to think like will will people really ever experience freedom but in, this, in those moments, we, we need to call to mind what you've done in our life. We need to remember where we were not too long ago and how your grace found us. And that that same grace that found us can find anybody and no matter what the struggle is. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would have your way. I pray that you would move in people's life. I pray that you would fill people with a, a deeper longing for you. In your name we pray, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am so excited to be with you guys today. I'm looking forward to really discussing the rest of these verses together. So let's dive in. Last week we, we really discussed... Um, um, we touched on verse 4, how Jude really wanted to admonish them. He really wanted to encourage the believers. But he found it more necessary to speak to them about contending, fighting for the faith. Because there was so much going on around the world at that moment. We talked about the persecution that was coming from the outside and how that was influencing um the, the churches during that time and during the time that Jude is, is writing, it's not an easy time. But more than what's coming outside, it's what's snuck inside the church, the corruption that's begun to take place. And, and Jude began to expound on that. And as we continue to read in the book of Jude, we're going to hear more about these false teachers which have snuck in. But by verse 5, we hear this. He says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Wait a minute. Jesus? That's crazy. You know, in some, some of your translations, it may say the Lord. But the reason why many scholars come in agreement with it being Jesus is because in the prior verses, how it begins to speak about Jesus Christ being the Lord, and then it continues to talk about either the Lord um, in reference to Christ. Within that, I remember um, um, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul begins to address what's known as a Christophany. A Christophany is, um, is an example of Christ, a foreshadow of Christ in the Old Testament. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. 
and the rock was Christ. Wow. Not, not the rock will be Christ, but the rock was Christ. You see, because Christ was, <laughs> and you know, he, he is and he will be. It, it, it's not just that Jesus suddenly appeared to us. Yeah, the the car the carnate Christ did, but the pre-incarnated Christ had always existed before time. <laughs> he had always been there at the father's father's side. I love it in the book of Jude. Sorry, I love it in the book of John. In the beginning, John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. The Logos was with God and the Logos was God. And, and, and was with God is this example of a mere image, an exact replica. You know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. You see, Jesus has always been it's not just that all of, all of a sudden he just showed up. He has always been. You know, we'll see different images of Christ, whether it be in Genesis when it's talking about Malchizedek, Malik Kilzedek, king of righteousness, having no beginning, having no ending. The Hebrew writer writes extensively on Malchizedek and the comparison. And though Malchizedek isn't the Christ, he is a foreshadow of Christ. Jesus is even greater than Melchizedek, the, the high priest Melchizedek. Amen. So he begins to talk about a Christ that I think in our society today, we don't really know this Jesus. We, we know more of a, um, a gracious Jesus, a, a Jesus who we think will just allow us to get away with anything. <laughs> he just loves us. But he begins to talk about this Jesus who loves you so much that he does not want you to continue in living a life of sin. He says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Destroyed those who did not believe. That doesn't line up or compute with the, the um, what is it, the seeker-sensitive churches that we have nowadays. It does not line up with what we know of as Jesus. You know, you'll hear it everywhere. Jesus is love. He, he would never do that. But I'm telling you, Jesus is also a judge. And he is a just judge. And so he begins to expound on what happened in the Old Testament, really just to warn, warn them that if they continue in the futility of, uh, of the false teaching, if they continue in error, if they continue to be persuaded by these people who have snuck into the church, they too are going to be judged as the children of Israel who did not believe were judged. Furthermore, he says this, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. You know, I told you at the beginning that the book of Jude is a book about apostasy. You know, apostasy has to do with people falling away from the faith, seeking their seeking their own desires, seeking their own wants, not really pursuing after Christ for um, who he is, but except for, for monetary gain. And he begins to talk really what's found in uh, in an extra canonical book of the Bible, um, which has to do with Moses's uh, laws. 
he talks about these angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He, Jesus, has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. Friends, this is a very sharp warning. It's a very, very sharp warning that if we continue in disobedience, there are consequences for living in disobedience. And you, you look at this, this image that these, these great angels who rebelled against God, and, and so some would say these may be the angels which uh, that that are referenced in um, in Genesis chapter chapter six, I believe, or um, or they may be the angels who are referenced in the extra canonical book of the book of Enoch. Um, whichever one it is, we know for sure that God, through Jesus Christ, has already judged angels who were disobedient, who had left their proper dwelling place. And pursued after things that they were not supposed to pursue. And you're getting this image of a God who has created you to be within your purpose. And that if you are out of your purpose, you're out of your use. You're out of what God has created you to be. You see, these angels were created with a purpose. To, to live within that purpose. When they decided to walk outside of the purpose that God had called them to walk in, they fell into disobedience and there was a consequence for that. Furthermore, the writer states, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual morality and pursued after unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. This is a topic that a lot of people do not really want to discuss. You know, when you look up unnatural desire, that has to do with men having sexual relationship with other men and women having sexual relationship with other women, what we're seeing really move into our culture again like it was in the past. And he gives this warning because Sodom and Gomorrah was a real place. Many even in the Christian faith now are beginning to wonder if this wasn't just some story told in Genesis. But I'm here to tell you, friend, that this was not just some story. Sodom and Gomorrah was a real place. It was a green, beautiful place. They talked about in the Old Testament in Genesis how it was like the Garden of Eden. The garden of God, filled with so much green, filled with so much life. Everybody wanted to be in Sodom and Gomorrah. Kind of reminds you of a place, right? <laughs> kind of reminds you of a, a nation that so many people were longing to be a part of. But Sodom and Gomorrah chose to walk away from God. And when we come back after this brief intermission, I'm going to discuss what transpired to Sodom and Gomorrah when, when they decided to be disobedient and pursue after their flesh instead of pursuing after the God who loves them. We'll be right back. My newest book, A Roaring Lion in Angel of Light. This book, um, I really, really love what the Holy Spirit 
um, has done actually in my own life through me writing this book. I believe that the enemy doesn't just attack in the same way everywhere. I believe that in certain areas, he acts different than others. Being from the Congo, I've had a lot of different experiences as it relates to the enemy attacking. I grew up um, under the tyranny of a man by the name of Mobutu. And it was difficult growing up with a tyrant, somebody who caused fear, right? And everybody was afraid of him except for those people which sought his favor. They always wanted to get his favor because they thought, well, maybe he'll make them rich. But it was always about pleasing him. It was about pleasing one man. And so going from that place to coming to America was night and day. When I came to America, it was like you can actually dream. Um, if you had something that you wanted to do, uh, you could see that be accomplished. And there was such a joy being in this country. And I really believe that God had given me a second chance at life. I realized that the devil works a lot different in America than he does in the Congo. In this book, I really want to expose these tactics. I want to just, I, I talk about how the enemy comes in the Western world like an angel of light. He pretends to be your friend. He, he wants to be close to you. And I believe that if we actually realize how the devil's attacking us, we realize that he's actually coming in either as an angel of light, we'll know how to deal with that. If we realize he's coming in like a roaring lion, we'll know how to deal with that. And in this book, I would like to help you to know how to overcome the roaring lion and the angel of light. Welcome back to the gospel with me, your host, Glory Ndongala. Continuing on, we were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and the tragic end of a place that was like the Garden of God. Beautiful. So many people wanted to live there. Lot moved his whole entire family to the pastures there. But unfortunately, it had a very terrible ending. And why did they have this terrible ending? It's because they chose to rebel against God. You know, it, it wasn't just the fact that they were going after and pursuing after unnatural flesh, which was homosexuality, um all sorts of perversions. It was the fact that they, they didn't even welcome sojourners. People who came from faraway journeys, they didn't take care of those people either. They were just overall a very ungodly nation. And unfortunately, they faced a very terrible judgment by God. You see, the Bible says that they now serve as an example. And you know, when we look at them, look at Sodom and Gomorrah, we should have this holy fear of God. You know, and, the, and, and, and here Jude says eternal fire. You know, it's like the fire which rained down from the heavens is still continuing to burn. For those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a very sad state. Now as we move from this verse. We get this. We get to go to this. Um, what, what do I want to call it? I, it it's, a, it's a series of passages. 
that really have have a direct correlation with what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2. So now I'm, I'm going to read what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1, it says this, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon, upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Wow! Doesn't that already sound like what Jude has written? Verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting he, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Does, does this sound very familiar? Because it, it really is. This is a, a confirmation. You won't find many passages besides the synoptic gospel that really correlate like these two do. It's almost word for word. Jude and Peter are writing right in line with each other. I believe that's for a reason. You know, it's something that's so important. I think the Lord allowed it to be in there for a reason. Just in case you missed it the first time. Just in case you didn't get to read the book of Jude. You still get it if you read First and Second Peter. And there's going to be more comparison. But I'm going to continue on to in the next verse of Jude. And then I'll be going back and forth in Peter because I think they really complement each other. Jude verse 8 says, Yet in like manner these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Isn't it crazy how it doesn't just say relying on their money? Relying on their status, you know, re relying on, the, it could have said relying on anything, but it says, yet also these people, yet in like manner, sorry, yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams. Now, this is very crucial, you know, and we've heard a lot of sermons which say, you know, just, you know, dream, you know. You, you should go ahead and dream and, and believe the dreams. I mean, I've, I've even encouraged people to dream. And, and I think it's very good as long as your dreams come from the dream maker. <laughs> as long as your dreams come from the dream maker. If you're dreaming dreams based on your own wants and your own desires, they can easily persuade you to walk away from God. 
They can easily cause you to defile your flesh and to reject the authority of God and to blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, now by glorious ones, you would think, man, it sounds like they're talking about um, amazing angels, right? Angels of God and not quite. You know, I believe that, yes, that, that could be a part of it. But here specifically, Jude begins to talk more so, and you will hear this more um, after this uh, a few verses. But he's really talking about actually the demonic angels. Actually, uh, the angels which fell away with Satan. Actually, talking about... Um, People who think in their own power, they can take on the devil. They think that they can just take him on and they can overcome him. And that's actually what he's addressing here. The glorious ones. And we will see more of that as we continue to read. Verse 9. This is, this is one of my favorite verses. And this is kind of connected again. Um, Jude is referencing a lot of times out of the extra canonical books, like the book of Enoch. So um, you won't find this story anywhere except for in those historical texts. Jude 1 verse 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presumed to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. My, oh my, oh my. When he was dealing with the devil. You know, after going through this book, prior to this, I would always be like, man, the devil's a loser. And I, I just, you know, you get this, this whole thought process. Yeah, I'm a Christian now. And I'm so much bigger than the devil, like me, you know. I'm, I'm so much stronger than the devil. Yo, listen. You are not stronger than the devil. God is stronger than the devil. It's the Spirit of God living in you that, that gives you the strength to overcome the enemy. Not you yourself. You see, when we begin to live in that level of arrogance, we begin to rely on our own strength. That's when we fall and we begin to slowly drift away from God. But, but look at Michael the archangel. Michael the lead angel. The word arch means lead angel. You know, Michael is referenced only about three times in the Bible. And, and this is one of the places that he's referenced. And in and, and this this place, you get this image, you know, of, um, of something that transpired. Some believe that when, when Moses hit the rock in the Old Testament, instead of speaking to it, you know, he, he sinned against God in such a way that it caused him, scripturally, not to be able to enter into the promised land. But this verse, some would say, it's because of the sin that he lived where the devil felt like the, that Moses belonged to him. That, that Moses should have went to hell, not with Michael the archangel, to a resting place. But when Michael the archangel came, you know, he could have used all sorts of things to dispute against the devil. Think about it. He's Michael. In Revelation, he talks about Michael throwing the devil out of heaven. And in this moment, you would, you would think, right, if it was you, if you, you experienced that, if you overcame the devil, what would you do in this moment? Wouldn't you try to, you know, hey, man, I beat you up already. I'll beat you up again. But that's not what Michael did. Woo that's not what Michael did. The lead angel, Michael whose name declares who is like God. You know, he, he did not dispute about the body of Moses. He did not get into an argument with the devil about this. 
He simply declared, the Lord Jesus rebuke you. Ooh, listen to me, brothers and sisters and, and uh, children and, and uh, babies and, <laughs> and pets. But listen to me. Listen to me very clearly. If Michael the archangel relies on the Lord, <laughs> who am I to rely on my own strength? If Michael the archangel is not going to try to contend against the devil in his own power, then trust me, I'm not going to try to fight the devil in my own power either. But we can learn a lot from Michael the archangel who did not fight in his own strength, but he trusted in the Lord. He did not even pronounce a blasphemous judgment. And this is what it means again. Remember how I said in, in the in, in uh, verse 8, how I was talking about the blaspheme against the glorious ones? And he's using this image and this picture. And he says glorious ones, and he's indicating actually the devil and the angels of the devil, uh, the angelic beings who are with the devil. And he calls them the glorious ones. Very interesting. You know, why, why does he do that? Because God still created these beings. God still made these beings. And we are made a little bit lower than the angels. We shouldn't feel so puffed up that, you know, oh yeah, I could take on the devil. I could take on... Man, listen, they didn't really lose all their power. <laughs> they lost their position. But they still have a lot of the power that God had placed in their life. And so when you try to be a lone ranger and you try to go out there and you fight the devil in your own power, trust me, you are not going to win. But when you trust the Lord, you will overcome him. Whoo, so good. I'm so excited. Verse 10, the last verse. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand and they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. I'm going to continue this verse in our next um, episode because I want to dive more into this verse and, and also connect it with 2 Peter chapter 2. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed this moment um, in the Word of God and really going verse by verse in Scripture and discussing God's Word. I love diving into God's Word. It's so powerful. It's so rich. Let me pray for you. Father, we, we need you. And we ask that God, you would make us just like you. And, and that heart that we read about Michael the Archangel, who did not rely on his own strength, who did not try to do it in his own power, but he trusted in you. God, we want to be like that. We want to trust in you. We don't want to rely on our own strength. We, want to, we don't want to do it by our own power. But we want to trust in you. God, I pray that anybody who is struggling and they've been struggling and they've been wrestling their flesh and trying to do it in their own strength, I just pray that in this moment they would release the fight to you. They would say, God, I give it to you. God, I surrender this fight to you. God, I cannot make it on my own. So, Father, I surrender it to you. Will you surrender the fight to God? I give it completely to you. Lord, you have your way in my life. You have your way with this struggle in my heart, in my mind, in my flesh, in my soul, in my spirit. Lord, you have your way with this struggle. You take it from me, God. And Father, forgive me for blaspheming against the glorious ones. Forgive me for thinking that 
in my own strength, I can take on the devil. I can take on his demons in my own power. When we know that your word declares it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us, to direct us, to heal our minds, and to be with us. In your name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. But always remember, God loves you the most. I'll see you next time. Take care.